Let us look into now some of the central strands of Van Til's critical interaction with Immanuel Kant. In his undervalued work, The Survey of Christian Epistemology, Van Til engages Kant's epistemology extensively, and he applies what he terms as the representational principle of Reformed Trinitarianism and Federalism to Kant's idealism. Now, I'm not going to expound the whole of the representational principle, but turn you to the book uh, entitled Van Til's uh, The Trinitarian Theology of Cornelius Van Til and the lectures in the module on Van Til's Doctrine of God. You can refresh at this point if you'd like to do that. I'm going to assume that as background, and we're going to move forward and see the way Van Til applies portions of Reformed Trinitarianism and Reformed Federalism to Kant's proposal. In the survey, page 108, Van Til, and I'm now going to put uh, Van Til just over on this side of the board. I want to keep uh, the, the, the gist of Kant's constructivist proposal in the Transcendentals here and look at Van Til over here on this other side of the board just a little bit. But in page 108 of the Survey of Christian Epistemology, Van Til says this. He says, The criticism of Kant on empiricism and rationalism was undoubtedly correct as far as his contention that the mind of man and the facts of the universe should never have been separated is concerned. But it is equally true that the more fundamental question still is whether the mind of man should ever have been thought of in separation from the mind of God. Now, let me pause and simply take that first sentence and remind you of something. Van Til is saying that as far as it goes, Kant was right to say that concepts and percepts should never be separated. So let me put this bluntly. The rationalists were wrong initially to separate a priori concepts from experience. The British empiricists were wrong to separate perceptions from all concepts, all a priori concepts. Van Til is saying Kant is a useful corrective of that narrow problem. And he says further that the mind of man and the facts of the universe should never have been separated. Now, what does that mean? mean? Does that mean he's agreeing with Kant fundamentally? Not at all. Because he goes on to say, secondly, that the mind of man should never have been thought of in separation from the mind of God. That is going to be one of the nuclear critiques of Kant. So let me talk about those two claims. Van Til agrees that we must avoid a priori principles and abstraction from concrete particulars and vice versa. But second, and to our point here, Van Til strenuously disagrees on precisely how Kant conceived the mind of man in relation to objects for consciousness as both are related to God. The more fundamental issue that Van Til raises with Kant is whether the mind of man ought to have been conceived in separation from God, from God's revelation, from the mind of God. In other words, Van Til urges that Kant posits a consciousness of self and object that does not include a consciousness of God. The entire Reformed conception of man, that he has never operated apart from an atmosphere of revelation, has not been affirmed by Kant. So Van Til challenges Kant precisely on this point. Have we properly conceived, listen, have we properly conceived of the mind of man If all we assert is that knowledge of self and knowledge of objects have this mutual dependence, 
that concepts and percepts are, are functionally related in knowing anything. Is that all that we would want to say? Van Til says no. And he goes on to say this. This is from the survey page 108. He says, how can the human mind know anything about any of the facts of the universe if these facts as well as the mind itself are not related upon the basis of a more fundamental unity in the plan of God? Yet it is exactly Kant's contention that the human mind does have a sphere of knowledge of its own apart from its relation to God and apart from the relation of the facts to God. And this position would not be tenable unless the mind of man, man were independent of the divine mind in some essential respect. In reality, it matters not whether one says man knows one fact or a thousand facts or all facts apart from God. Now here's what I want you to think about with me. Meditate on what we've said about Kant, and I want to, to, to help you see what Van Til's saying now about the plan of God. And so he's thinking about decree, and he's thinking about the execution of the decree in the work of creation, and he's thinking about the upholding of creation in the special uh, in general, providence of God. Van Til is arguing that when it comes to the relation of minds and objects, the interdependent relation between them, he's saying that the principle of their unity, please hear this, is not the mind of man, but the plan of God. The decree of God, the work of creation, and the work of providence, that plan is what accounts for the mutual and perfect fit between created minds and created objects. The relationship of minds and objects functionally related to one another is the direct result of the plan, the decree, the creation, and the providence of the triune God. And so, the plan of God, its execution in the work of general and special creation, the upholding of all that God has created in providence, supplies now what we're going to call here, I'm going to use this term, an organic connection between minds and objects. There's an organic connection. And that organic connection is itself a revelation of God. Kant's notion, by contrast, his notion of theoretical reason, posits that the mind of man exists independent of the natural knowledge of God and that the relation between minds and objects is owed purely to what? The active and constructive intuitions of the understanding. But Van Til is not concerned to stop at that point. Van Til continues with his critique of Kant and applies a doctrine of what we can call the representational principle to Kantian idealism. Now remember this, I'll just say this by way of review. The representational principle in Van Til is the integration of Reformed Trinitarianism and Reformed Federalism in application and in synthesis. It's the integration of a Reformed doctrine of the ontological trinity and a Reformed doctrine of temporal creation and Adam as image of God and in covenant with God. Now Van Til is, th is therefore going to make a second main critique. The first point, number one, 
is that the relation of minds and objects, this organic relation, is due to the plan of God. The second point that Van Til is going to make is the nature of the relation between the cre Creator and the creature when it comes to reason. Okay, so the first point, minds and objects are organically related due to the plan of God, not due to the autonomous activity of the mind. The second point that Van Til is going to make is that there's a concern that Kant does not have a proper conception of reason. Now, in order to help us understand this, let me give you another quote from Van Til. And I want us to talk about this creator-creature relation, which he calls now the representational principle that integrates Trinity and federalism. I'll just say Trinitarianism, Reform Trinitarianism and Reform Federalism. First, Van Til says this. Even to say that one fact is knowable to man directly, apart from the relation of both fact and mind to the plan of God, is in effect to deny that God is absolutely self-conscious. It is in effect to deny that reality must ultimately and exclusively be interpreted in eternal categories. Even to say that one fact can be known by man apart from God is to deny the representational character of human thought. Now here's the key, listen. It would be to claim originality for human thought and as such would be a denial of the creation of man by God. Now I want to pinpoint two things in what Van Til is saying here, at least these uh, initial two things. First, Van Til says that when we're talking about the Creator, the Creator is absolutely self-conscious. Absolutely self-conscious. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to say God is absolutely self-conscious in Van Til's language? It means this. That God is self-contained in His being and omniscient in His knowledge. He's infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in His being, in His knowledge. Francis Turretin summarizes, I think, what Van Til is after when he speaks of the knowledge of God. And, and he unites both the natural knowledge of God and the free knowledge of God in a fundamental and inseparable unity. Listen to what he says. I'm going to give you a somewhat extensive quote from the Institutes and then bring this to bear on what Van Til is saying. Turton says, although the knowledge of God is one and simple, intrinsically no less than his essence, yet it can be considered in different ways extrinsically as to objects. But it is commonly distinguished by theologians into the knowledge of simple intelligence, or natural and indefinite, and the knowledge of vision, or free and definite. The former is the knowledge of things merely possible and is therefore called indefinite because nothing on either hand is determined concerning them by God. The latter is the knowledge of future things and is called definite because future things are determined by the sure will of God. 
Hence, they mutually differ, one, in object, because the natural knowledge is occupied with possible things, but the free about future things. Two, in foundation, because the natural is founded on the omnipotence of God, but the free depends upon his will and decree by which things pass from a state of possibility to a state of futurition. Three, in order, because the natural precedes the decree, but the free follows it because it beholds things future. Now they are not future except by the decree. Now what does he affirm here? Please hear this. This is extremely important and it helps flesh out what Van Til is saying about God being absolutely self-conscious. God's knowledge is one and simple as his divine essence. Yet he knows all things possible, natural, and actual, free. But the free knowledge of God, the knowledge of the actual world, remains as simple and immutable as God's being and God's will. So when Van Til speaks of God as absolutely self-conscious, he is affirming that the triune God knows all things by an eternal act of intuition and that such knowledge of the world that God would create is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Even though we can distinguish between natural and free knowledge, the knowledge of God is one and is simple. Now, the Reformed have rejected not only middle knowledge that you find in Molinism, but also the central notion of a so-called covenantal mind that, in terms of free knowledge, develops along with the creature. This is a teaching popularized in, for instance, in Scott Oliphant's God With Us. In that volume, God's free knowledge is where a covenantal mind from all eternity is generated, and that covenantal mind incrementally develops and gains knowledge through time, just like the creatures. Van Til will have nothing of either the Molinist conception of middle knowledge or this Neo-Socinian conception of an ignorant, developing covenantal mind. God's being and God's knowledge are equally infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. He has neither attributes that develop over time nor knowledge that develops over time. When Van Til says God is absolutely self-conscious, he means that his being and knowledge are infinite and immutable. Immutable in his being, omniscient in his knowledge, as he relates to creation. Now, for those of you who are interested, you can consult Van Til's discussion of divine knowledge in the defense of the faith and listen to the Van Til group with Drs. Wynn and Busey, and I'm, I'm in there as well. And the, and the point that Van Til makes in the defense of the faith, the point that he's making here in the survey, page 108, is this. If such a God exists and he is fully self-conscious in the sense that his being and knowledge are infinite, eternal, and unchanging, and if this God implants a natural knowledge of himself in all image-bearing creatures, then his revelation cannot be suspended in the contemplation of self and objects. And this is precisely the Kantian problem. It's exactly the Kantian problem. Kant substitutes the active mind of man for the eternally self-contained and absolutely self-conscious triune God. And in doing so, he ascribes to the subjective and active understanding an intrinsic autonomy. So, 
Point one is that Van Til says you have to begin with the absolute self-conscious triune God, and it is this God who has revealed himself, and therefore his being, his knowledge, his plan, his work of creation, his act of special providence is absolutely decisive on everything we say about the nature of the, of the subject and object. Kant's theoretical model of reason has denied that first principle. Number one, the plan of God is what accounts for the reciprocal relation between minds and objects. And number two, the representational principle in a God who is absolutely self-conscious. Now, number three, Van Til says that Kant has also denied classical reformed federalism with his view of theoretical reason. To say that one fact can be known apart from God, let me say that again, let me emphasize that differently. To say that one fact, any fact, pick any fact that you want, can be known apart from God denies the federalism and the Trinitarianism in the representational principle. To say one fact can be known apart from God. Kant says all facts can be known apart from God. Van Til says, narrow that down. What to say one fact can be known apart from God is to deny the classical Trinitarianism and the classical federalism that the representational principle sets forth. Why? Because it would deny concreated natural knowledge of God given to every image bearer before and after the fall. To say that one fact can be known apart from God is to deny that knowledge of God is given along with knowledge of self and fact. Listen to what Van Til says. Van Til says, Kant thought, this is a survey of Christian epistemology, SCE, most of this is from the survey of Christian epistemology, page 108. Listen to this. He says, Kant thought that man could get along without God in the matter of scientific knowledge. When he says scientific knowledge, he means theoretical reason. He says, it is thus that the representational principle, which we saw to be the heart of Christian theistic theory of knowledge, is set aside. If man knows certain facts, whether or not God knows these facts, as would be the case in the Kantian position, if it were true, man's knowledge would be done away with. Whatever sort of God may remain on Kant's view, he is not the supreme interpretive category of human experience. And so what Van Til's getting at here and what we're going to, to look at here in a bit more detail is that the view of reason, Kant enshrines, is a view that denies what we're going to say is essential to this creator-creature relation. And as we move forward, I want to now specify and pinpoint this third point here about the nature of reason itself in relation to the fully self-conscious triune God. Now, as we're moving along in Van Til's critical interaction with Kant, Rejecting this theoretical reason and this constructivism, Van Til says that minds and objects have an organic relation to one another in virtue of the plan of God, not the absolute and constructive activity of the mind. Secondly, he says that we must reason representationally and that reasoning begins with an absolutely self-conscious God, a God who is immutable in his being and omniscient as he relates to creation, this is the God who reveals himself. And third, that 
yields a very distinctive conception of reason. Third point, then, we're going to compare and contrast Van Til's view of reason in the representational principle to Kant's conception of theoretical reason in his constructivist transcendental idealism. Now, Van Til brings Kant directly into view in the Survey of Christian Epistemology, page 174. And so, especially when we're thinking here, page 174 about Van Til uh, and, and his critique of Kant, we need to hear this. This is important. He says, quote, If man is given any original interpretive power to begin with, that is, if man can, in any sense, come into contact with any object of knowledge apart from God, that power can never be taken from him. And if any special revelation should later come to man, it could never be absolute, because the interpretive element that man himself would contribute would always introduce the independently contingent. End of quote. Now here, Van Til speaks of Adam as created and posits two things by way of critique. First, if by virtue of creation Adam were given any original interpretive power to begin with that could never be taken from him, then it would be an enduring and inalienable gift. Adam would have original interpretive power. And what does he mean by that? He means Kant. He means if Adam had the categories that Kant claims he has, the transcendental aesthetic and the transcendental analytic, and he had them independently of his knowledge of God, then he would always be testing the revelation of God to see to what degree it comports with those original interpretive categories inherent to him. Van Til is saying, please hear this, that is not a Christian view of reason as created by God. Why? Well, secondly, on the assumption that Adam were given this legislative, constructive, original reason. Van Til says that would not comport with covenant theology. If it were the case, he says, that Adam had original interpretive power to begin with, then special revelation, the revealed terms of the covenant of works, could never have absolute authority. Kant's notion of reason as having original interpretive power is inconsistent with the self-authenticating authority of natural and special revelation. The moment you conceive of Adam with this constructive original interpretive power, you have gutted the substance of the deeper Protestant conception. Why? Well, if you think back to what Voss taught and what Van Til taught, which we surveyed in the Doctrine of Revelation. You remember that reason never at any point existed apart from special revelation. Reason is not only a revelation from God internal to man, but as a gift from God, it is properly subject to the authority of his word. Gerhardus Voss in the RD 2, 43 through 44, says this about Adam's relation to God. He says, since Adam was perfect in every respect, along with his natural relationship to God, belonged a completely clear awareness of this relationship. Now let's pause. Given Adam's nature as the image of God, along with his natural relationship to God, 
There was a completely clear awareness of that relationship. He knew from nature by innate knowledge what God could demand of him, that he stood under God's authority, under the moral opposition between good and evil, that upon breaking the natural relationship, punishment would follow. All of this and still more, he was assured of the favor of God in life, provided he preserved, uh, persevered in the good. Point one here under our third point about reason is that by virtue of creation, Adam naturally knew God, naturally knew the obligations of God, naturally had a relation to God by which he was under authority. And so in the nature of the case, reason is not an independent, constructive authority. It's naturally subordinate to the authority of God by virtue of the image endowment. Secondly, Foss distinguishes the work of special creation from an, uh, the terms of the covenant in an act of special providence. The former confers natural religious fellowship in the image of God, the latter the positive terms by which that relation can advance. And Voss makes explicit that by assuming the positive character of the covenant of works in this sense, we don't intend to assert Adam existed for a single moment outside of the covenant of works. He was apparently created destined to be under it. The distinction between natural relationship and the covenant of works is logical and judicial, not temporal. And so Voss is insisting on what the Shorter Catechism insists, that when God had created man in true knowledge, righteousness, and holiness as the image of God, he then and there entered into a covenant of works with him. The image without the covenant is blind. The covenant without the image is empty. But now Van Til goes on to speak in this way, uh, building on what um, Voss is saying. He says that God reveals himself to the mind of man, and he does so by virtue of creation. I read this quote earlier from Survey of, of Christian Epistemology, um, page one. He says, God revealed himself in nature and God revealed himself in the mind of man. Thus, we may characterize the whole situation by saying that creation of God is a revelation of God and it is impossible for the mind of man to function except in an atmosphere of revelation. And every thought of man when it is functioning normally in this atmosphere of revelation, would express the truth as laid in the creation by God. Please remember this. The truth of God's revelation is laid in the creation by God, and the revelation of God is given in the mind of man as a creature. This is destructive of Kant's constructivism. God embeds into creation itself a revelation of himself. God implants in the mind of man a revelation of himself. And God reveals to man in the garden an external verbal revelation. The mind of man remains surrounded by an atmosphere of revelation. And then Van Til says this, If Kant is right, quote, the whole idea of revelation of the self-sufficient God drops to the ground if man himself is autonomous or self-sufficient, or if man is not himself revelational in the internal structure of his being, because he could receive no revelation that comes to him from without. If it, it, on the other hand, if man is in any sense autonomous, 
he is not in need of revelation. If he is then said to possess the truth, he possesses it as the product of the ultimately legislative powers of his intellect. Now, this needs to be understood. Van Til here excoriates the Kantian conception of the ultimately legislative power of the intellect. Van Til denies that the understanding is constructive of the intelligibility of experience. Van Til denies that the understanding is constitutive of the rational aspects of objects in experience. And he sets directly over against this Kantian constructivism, the notion that the intellect is ultimately legislative. He sets over against that the deeper Protestant conception of internal natural revelation, external special revelation, and insists that we understand the intellect in this way. I want to read you a quote now from page 8 of the Christian theory of knowledge. Putting perhaps the sharpest contrast to Kant's view of theoretical reason, Van Til says this, Christianity assumes that man is created. The non-Christian assumes that the facts of man environment are not created. The Christian assumes these facts are created. The Christian has derived his convictions on these matters from Scripture as the infallible Word of God. As self-explanatory, God naturally speaks with absolute authority. It is Christ as God who speaks in the Bible. Therefore, here's the key, listen, the Bible does not appeal to human reason as ultimate in order to justify what it says. It comes to the human being with absolute authority and its, its claim is that human reason itself must be taken in the sense in which Scripture takes it, namely, as created by God and as therefore properly subject to the authority of God. The contrast to Kant could not be clearer. Reason itself is revelational of God, internal general revelation. The objects to which reason relates are revelational of God, external general revelation. Reason itself is created by God and designed to be subject to the authority of his special revelation before the fall in the covenant of works, after the fall in scripture, and general and special revelation together are necessary, sufficient, perspicuous, and authoritative, the one never given without the other. This is the most comprehensive antithesis to Kant conceivable, and it runs through every level of Van Til's critique without compromise. So when Van Til speaks of his apologetic, speaks of a Christian approach as transcendental, which he does, he is taking the language from Kant, and he is contrasting Kant's philosophy to reform Trinitarianism and federalism by saying, listen, it's not the mind of man that is the transcendental. It is the plan, decree, creation, revelation, providence, and work of God that makes the world and its objects intelligible and that makes minds and objects relate. And what I'm going to do in the next section as we move into a, a fourth point is I want to show you that Van Til says that the doctrine of temporal creation invests objects and subjects with an intrinsic intelligibility that derives from God and not man. And we'll move to that critique in our next lecture. Now, as we continue on, I, I want to talk uh, number four, and uh, I, I think I'll just title it this by way of a bullet point, uh, The Doctrine of Creation. Um, Van Til likes to call it temporal creation and the intrinsic intelligibility of the created order.
the intrinsic intelligibility of objects. Now, remember that Kant's central claim, Kant's central claim, is that the understandingly const understanding constructively conforms objects to the mind, both to space and time, the transcendental aesthetic, and to rational categories, the transcendental analytic. Then Till wants to reject this and replace it with the doctrine of what I'm going to call the intrinsic intelligibility of created subjects and objects, the intrinsic intelligibility of them as created. First, Kantian idealism, according to Van Til, requires that while we affirm the existence of the external world, we cannot affirm its intrinsic intelligibility and rationality. Now think about that. It's a little bit of a fine-grained distinction, but, but think of it. In Kant's philosophy, there are objects for consciousness, but the objects themselves have to be rendered intelligent by two, at least two, primal constructive activities of the mind. The objects have to be rendered intelligibly in terms of spatio-temporal categories in the aesthetic and in terms of rational categories of analysis in the analytic. But there's, this is the key. Things in themselves, subjects in themselves, objects in themselves lack inherent intrinsic intelligibility. To put it a little differently, there is nothing in the objects of experience for the mind to discover because the mind imposes an, an extrinsic order on the objects encountered. Second, and just as a result of this, there is no natural theoretical knowledge of God given along with the, uh, uh, with the knowledge of objects and experience. If we're to pursue God, we have to do it with regulative concepts that pertain to ethics in, in practical reason, not in the spatial, temporal, and rational categories of theoretical reason. And so this is the twofold problem with Kant. Objects themselves are not intrinsically intelligible, apart from the constructive activity of the mind, and natural knowledge of God is not attainable. So Van Til makes two fundamental responses to Kant, and I want to focus especially now on the intrinsic intelligibility of created objects. Van Til says, in response to Kant, that it is the being, knowledge, plan, and the creative agency of God. This is going to be the key. It is the creative agency of God himself that confers upon objects of experience an intrinsic intelligibility. Van Til is explicit that mind and objects relate to one another due to the eternal plan and creative work of God so that Van Til insists objects for consciousness are not intrinsically inchoate, are not intrinsically unknowable and standing in need of the constructive activity of the mind in order to be known, he says instead that objects for human consciousness are determined and created by God. They have been decreed by God, created by God, and sustained by God, and it is therefore God and not man who makes the objects of experience inherently intelligible as spatial, inherently intelligible as temporal, 
inherently intelligible as rational. Van Til says this, the survey 201, it is not as though we already know some facts and laws to begin with, irrespective of the existence of God, in order then to reason from such a beginning to further conclusions. It's certainly true that if God has any significance for any object of knowledge at all, the relation of God to that object of knowledge must be taken into consideration from the outset. And what is that relation? Let me call it this. It's an intelligibility conferring relation. The objects created by God are rendered intelligible by God and not by man. And the basic point we make about God's relation to the object of knowledge is found in our doctrine of creation. That's why I have temporal creation deserves all the emphasis we can give it when we're critiquing Kant on this matter. Van Til says this, the uh, first edition of Defense of the Faith. He says, our argument for the objectivity of knowledge with respect to the universe can never be complete and satisfactory unless we bring in the relation of both the object and the subject to the knowledge of God. If the Christian position with respect to creation, that is, with respect to the idea of the origin of both the subject and the object of human knowledge is true, there is and must be objective knowledge. In that case, the world of objects was made in order that the subject of knowledge, namely man, should interpret it under God. Without the interpretation of the universe by man to the glory of God, the whole world would be meaningless. The subject and the object are therefore adapted to one another. On the other hand, if the Christian theory of creation by God is not true, then we hold there cannot be objective knowledge of anything. If that is the case, all things in the universe are unrelated and cannot be in fruitful contact with one another. Now, what is he saying? Let me summarize it in different language. The doctrine of creation secures an external created world. And the subject and object are related to one another so that there is objective knowledge of the things God has planned, created, and revealed. The mind of man is confronted with that which is intrinsically intelligible because created by God and revelational of God. And if that is the case, the mind of man does not constitute the intelligibility of experience. The mind of man is created to receive the intelligibility of experience as created and interpreted by God. Second, along with making objects intelligible for the mind of man, God reveals himself in the same act by which those objects are known. Now, I've talked about this before. I've given you some quotes. Let me give you one I don't think I've given you. He says, Reformed theology as worked out by Calvin and his recent exponents such as Hodge, Warfield, Kuyper, and Bavink holds that man's mind is derivative. As such, it is naturally in contact with God's revelation, surrounded by nothing but revelation. It itself is inherently revelational. It cannot naturally be conscious of itself without being conscious of its creatureliness. For man, self-consciousness presupposes God-consciousness. Calvin speaks of this as man's inescapable sense of deity. So what, what is he saying? Well, knowledge of God, knowledge of the world, and knowledge of the self are given in the same noetic act, and this is knowledge of what is intrinsically intelligible as made and revealed by God, not what is inherently unintelligible being made intelligible by the intuitional apparatus of human understanding. That is a profound departure from the view of Kant.
Knowledge of self includes a knowledge of God. Knowledge of laws includes a knowledge of God. Knowledge of facts includes a knowledge of God. The very mind of man is revelational and all that God reveals is made intrinsically intelligible, perspicuous by God himself. Now to put this one final way, and I'm not going to make this an independent point, Van Til says in light of this, that Kant is not truly transcendental. He's not truly transcendental. Van Til says this, these points that we've put up on the board, is what he means by transcendental. I'm going to underline it in red so you don't miss it. This is transcendental. This is not this is a transcendental understanding of how human knowledge is possible. Knowledge of self, knowledge of facts, knowledge of laws, knowledge of God, all are given in a single act of revelation that is made intrinsically intelligible by God and not by man. Van Til then is taking from Kant everything and leaving Kant with nothing. He says this, Any method, as was pointed out above, that does not maintain that not a single fact can be known unless it is God that gives that fact meaning is an anti-Christian method. Now, the only argument for an absolute God that holds water is a transcendental argument. The transcendental argument seeks to discover what sort of foundations the house of human knowledge must have in order to be what it is. A truly transcendent God and a transcendental method go hand in hand. What is he saying? Is he a Kantian? No, he's not a Kantian. He's the antithesis of a Kantian. And he's saying this, that if you want the conditions for the possibility of the knowledge of anything, you must presuppose and confess this God in terms of a representational principle that sets forth Reformed, Confessional, Trinitarianism, and Federalism. He says, it is not as though we already know some facts and laws to begin with, irrespective of the existence of God. Hard pause. Who is that? That's Kant. Kant is saying we know all of these facts. We know every spatio-temporal fact organized according to quantity, quality, time, uh, 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 pardon me, quantity, quality, relation, and modality. All of them independent of our knowledge of God. But Van Til says that we have been redeemed from that kind of reasoning. He says, it is certainly true that if God has any significance for any object of knowledge at all, the relation of God to that fact of knowledge must be taken into consideration from the outset. Listen now. It is this fact that the transcendental method seeks to, reconcile, to recognize. Do you hear that? Survey of Christian Epistemology, 201. Let me read those two sentences one more time. It is certainly true that if God has any significance for any object of knowledge at all, the relation of God to that object of knowledge must be taken into consideration from the outset. It is this fact that the transcendental method seeks to recognize. What is he doing? He is stripping away all of the idealism of Kant, all of the constructivism of Kant. And he is saying that the relation not between finite minds and finite objects, but the relation between this God and these subjects and objects he has created and given intelligibility and revealed himself through both subject and object, it is this God with whom we need to begin. He describes Kant's notion 
of the way the mind relates to phenomena without reference to God, and he rejects it entirely and sets over against it a reformed view of the creator-creature relation. And so what is he doing? Please hear this. He takes the term transcendental, entirely strips it of its transcendental idealist substance, and re-expresses it in terms of Reformed Trinitarian theism. God himself is the transcendental whose existence and revelation must be taken into account from the outset of the subject-object relation. Contrary to Kant, the main question in epistemology is not the relation of the finite subject to the finite object, whether the object conforms to mind or mind conforms to object. The main question is how created subjects and objects relate to the self-contained trinity. So please grasp this. Grasp what Van Til both denies in Kant and what he replaces or puts in the place of Kant. Against Kant, Van Til denies that objects conform to the constructive understanding of man. Against Kant, Van Til denies that knowledge of objects is devoid of the natural knowledge of God. And against Kant, Van Til denies that there is no intrinsic intelligibility to the objects for consciousness. In its place, what does he put? He puts in its place that the constructive understanding of man, as Kant presents it, does not exist. And instead, we begin with the being, the knowledge, the revelation, and the work of the triune God, who gives all subjects and objects an intrinsic intelligibility and reveals himself through all created objects and even in the mind of man himself. God not the constructive understanding, confers intelligibility on objects, and his revelation envelops all creation. Van Til's language of a transcendental method, then, is designed, as I said a moment ago, to take everything from Kant and leave him nothing. He takes away the central tenet of transcendental idealism, and he replaces it with the self-contained ontological trinity in his being and in his revelation, the substance of the representational principle. He takes away in one single stroke the central Kantian commitment that there is a realm of appearances that can be known independent of God himself.